Good morning, Year 12s. So I'm going to talk you through your last little bit of revision for Churchill before I ask you at the end of this week to complete a, an assessment on Churchill. Um, then next week, hopefully I'll see all of you in school on either Wednesday or Thursday um, in our lesson. Um, at that point, we're going to start talking through your coursework and planning ahead for that. I will set you up with some research for that um, so that you, then you can take it away and do some independent work on it. Um, we'll have that much more open ended than we've had the current work. Um, so this is the last little bit of revision that I'll do with you. As you can see on my screen, I'm having some trouble with Microsoft Word, so I'm just showing you a screen off my email. So apologies for that. But you will be able to see this screen, which is your um, the table that I'd like you to complete this week. Um, I'll put that on show my homework for you as always. So what you're doing is you're using the notes that I'm going to give you to jot down in what way did the relationship between Churchill and, and um, Roosevelt, Stalin and De Gaulle work positively, and then what, in what way was the, were there controversies, and what way do they encounter difficulties? So you'll also have each of the three worksheets here for you. As you've found, they are very detailed, um, and you will find that they go through lots of things in lots of detail. Um, so starting for Churchill and Roosevelt, um, so obviously this goes way back into the past we're talking about um pre-war um remember that america we know is, is firmly isolationist they are not getting involved in the crisis that's going on in europe um woodrow wilson who is um the um the u.s president following the first world war starts the league of nations which is the precursor to the un um but america decides okay we don't want to get involved in more crises that are going on in the world we've got enough to deal with in our our country and they stay away from everything else that happens what happens um partly as a, as a result of the u.s policy of isolationism, the League of Nations fails um, and the Europeans realise they cannot rely upon America for their help. Fast forwarding forward, um, Roosevelt seems to be much more um, progressive and in, in, in terms of getting involved in European affairs and trying to um, trying to be more of an international diplomat. However, he's not very forward about this um, and it's not until the um, the um, Pearl Harbor attack in 1940, um, 1941, sorry, that um, that changes. So um, Churchill um, is appealing up to, to to Roosevelt this entire time about uh, trying to um, trying to get some help. Um, they get the Lend Lease Act signed by uh, Roosevelt and the Congress, and what that does is it gives 36.1 billion worth of equipment, which is it says the bottom 585 billion. Uh, in, in modern currency. So, you know, a, a huge amount of money going to the Allies, so Britain, France, later on um, Russia and, and China as well. Um, and that is coming straight from American coffers. So the Americans are getting involved a kind of, uh, you know, not directly. Um, obviously, when uh, Pearl Harbor actually happens, he got a photograph of some of the destruction of the US Navy. That then turns the tide of the war. Churchill says, we had, we had won. Um, he's confident that with the American involvement that that uh, tide will turn in his advantage. And then what you'll find in the rest of the document is more information about how Churchill and Roosevelt get along. Now, they'd met each other early on before either either the two of them were, were leading their country. and didn't really get on very well then. However, as you um, as you'll read, they began to uh, develop a working relationship, even if neither of them were particularly easy to work with. They um, they did achieve victory in the end. However, we've mentioned a few times about the, the strategy. So um, we know that um, Churchill wanted to focus on North Africa, on Italy, um, and, and defending the British Empire's interests using the Suez Canal and North Africa as, as outposts there. However, the Americans wanted this Operation Sledgehammer, which was to then become um, Operation Overlord, which is D-Day, in eventually in 1944. Um, the British under Churchill were not really keen on that, so that was an area of controversy, so use that to help you. Um, however, we talked a lot about the power that Churchill held. Um, we've talked about um, uh, Tehran being a bit of a, um, an embarrassment for for the British there being completely overlooked by uh, by Roosevelt and Stalin getting on much, much better than Churchill could ever have hoped to. And um, we've got some information here about 
the bitterness of the exchanges, you know, Ruth about not, not wanting to get involved in the relationship here. Um, and an, an image of the vast, vast preparations and um, massive undertaking of D-Day. Never before and never since has such a massive military campaign ever, be under, ever been undertaken. Um, you've got aircraft, you've got landing platforms here, you've got huge, 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 great big um, you know, warships are taking massive amount of tanks and jeeps and um, and supplies across the across the channel. You've got um, temporary harbors, of course, Mulberry harbors, which are uh, created. You've then got bridges, which are just essentially just rolled out onto the land to try and keep the tanks above ground. You know, it's a huge, huge, huge um, invasion that um, Britain and America have had to work. And France and Canada, of course, as well, have had to work very closely together. So, despite the bitterness of the exchanges, the D-Day campaign is successful, um, and uh, it, it reaches exactly what the um, what the overall achievement, uh, overall aim is, which is to defeat Nazi Germany. Keep scrolling through here and find out a little bit about Churchill and Roosevelt as a reflection. Okay, you'll find then there's two more documents: Churchill and Stalin. Um, here it's, it's it's controversial, isn't it? Churchill absolutely cannot stand um, cannot stand communism, and here he is having to work with the person who's championing communism for the whole of his country, and we then hear the whole of uh, as much of the world as he can dominate as well. So it's always going to be really really difficult for Churchill um, to get along with with Stalin. You know, he's, he's an outspoken critic. Um, it was difficult. It's going to be difficult for him to buy his tongue at the best of times, let alone uh, when in the same room as Stalin. Um, especially as in 1939, Stalin and Hitler joined forces and decided to um, you know, sort out the Polish problem. And what they meant by that was they were just going to divide Poland up between them, take half each, and that was the preamble to the war. So. Um, you know, Stalin had gone from being an enemy in 1939 to suddenly, um, in after the uh, Germans turned around and invaded them, suddenly they became became allies. So um, here we have, you know, Churchill biting his tongue and allying with a with a, a communist country, but also a communist country who's who's changed sides. It's very very complex. Um, you then then got another complexity uh, that. Um, that Stalin believes that America and Britain have sort of left them in the lurch. Here we've got Lend-Lease in its very early stages still supplying um, Stalin with goods, but they believe not enough. Um, there's, uh, you know, uh, only one front in from 1941 onwards, um, well, 1940 onwards when British and the French withdraw from Dunkirk. Um, and that that second front is is against the um, the Russians from 1941. Um, at that point, Russia is bearing the brunt of the of the war, um, with Battle of Stalingrad being one of those key points where you know there's there's huge destruction and a massive massive death toll. A million people die in uh, in the Battle of Stalingrad. So here we have lots and lots of issues that um, that Stalin and Churchill are going to have to get over in order to to work together. Um, you've got the fate of Poland as well, um, as well, which is going to make the, the, the situation much more controversial. It then becomes, as you know, Poland becomes a much more controversial uh, situation much later after the war um, as a um, marker of Soviet expansion into the East and the beginnings of the Cold War. Which you have in the beginning of a mention here at the Alta Conference, which is arguably kind of the beginning of the Cold War, a uh, century agreement, which is um the at uh, the uh, you know, a, a promise to settle this question about Poland who should have control and um and, and where that should should lie here is Churchill just scrawling on a piece of paper just uh, giving different countries different parts of a uh, of a um of, of Poland he, he calls it himself a naughty document so he's actually showing clearly that he's not necessarily comfortable with with the the um, creation of the document as well. Keep having a look as well, and you can find a little bit about the personal relationship. Whilst there's a lack of trust, we know that they um, they, they drank together and they had quite nice times together. Um, here we have 
them enjoying a meal together in, in the Kremlin, um, drinking vodka as only the Russians can. Um, we know Churchill had quite a, uh, quite a stomach for that as well. Um, so to keep having a look through, you've got some um, information about the end of the war um, and the end of the, the working relationship between the two and the beginnings of the, um, uh, uh, you know, of the hostility that's going to mark the Cold War. Finally, Churchill and de Gaulle. This is de Gaulle here, tall, French. Um, this is Churchill, short, squat and British, um, two very different figures and two people who stand for very different uh, ideas. Um, de Gaulle obviously uh, is living in Britain throughout the war um, after the French have, um, have surrendered to the German invasion in 1940. Um, it's a very difficult position for, for de Gaulle because he's not actually the, the leader of France. OK, he's, he's just a representative who is representing what he calls it or what is known as the free French movement. Um, so he's not an, an elected leader, but people are in France are treating him as such and he believes he is as such. He does become president of France following the war, um, but that's a difficult position for other leaders such as Churchill to um, to, to use to relate to him because you know he's he's not actually a leader he's not they're not actually equals but he's still he's still requiring to be treated as such this therefore leaves quite a controversial and quite a difficult relationship between the two so Churchill being a really keen um Francophile somebody who, who absolutely loves France and French is uh, you know is, is obviously going to be working with the French as much as per possible um, you've got some information here about Churchill trying to stop the French from um, from um, surrendering to the Nazis. He have a picture of Adolf Hitler in front of the Eiffel Tower, very iconic. Um, and if you have a look here, it's a very important image. This blue area is the free zone. This area here is the occupied zone, the, the area that the Nazis occupy. So I was talking about D-Day landings before, that happens all along here on the Normandy coast. Um, and it's the free zone, the, the free French, who are also helping the Allies to, um, to, to remove the occupation forces, the, the Nazi forces in, in uh, Northern France. So um, it's a very controversial relationship, as we've said. Um, this is part of the reason why it's so controversial. I've mentioned this before. Um, so there's a he calls it the hateful decision where he just where Churchill did orders to destroy the French navy so it does not fall into German hands. This is uh, one of the points when um, de Gaulle, one of the points at which de Gaulle cannot forgive Churchill. Um, believes that you know he, this cannot be forgotten, and therefore that relationship becomes more hostile as we go. Okay, um, keep scrolling through and find a little bit more about De Gaulle, um, what he stands for, and um, and uh, what that means he about his, his working relationship with the British and Roosevelt as well as Churchill as well. Okay, you'll find more down here about the um, the working relationship here, reconciliations in the British and French, especially in um, the later campaigns, for example, here, Operation Overlord, also known as D-Day. Okay, um, now you'll find here that um, the, <laughs> the, the tone here is very clear. Uh, with discussing regard rather than friendship between um, friend, uh, de Gaulle and Churchill. Um, de Gaulle famously, as we know through studying the membership of the EU, absolutely refuses to allow British membership as well. So that hostility between um, what de Gaulle believes is British interests, um, it continues further through history. It is not until de Gaulle dies and is no longer the president of France, um, obviously one happens or the other, that um, that Britain is able to join the EU in 19, or the precursor to the EU, the EEC in 1973. So what I'd like you to do, use this information that I've just gone through, obviously you'll have to go through it much more slowly than I've discussed, to fill out your table, submit me your table, and what I'll put on show my homework is the question that I'd like you to complete as well. Now, um, I'm not going to insist you do this in exam conditions, obviously I can't because we're remote learning, but what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to uh, do your best at 
testing yourself, seeing how much you remember, both from our learning and from the recent revision we've been doing. Spend 45 to 50 minutes, no longer, completing the assessment of the four sources and then submit it to me in the usual way over show my homework. Now I'm going to set this to be due next week when either on Wednesday or, th or Thursday when I see you. Um, I will not be able to take in physical pieces of work, I think, um, because we don't want to be both touching the same piece of paper. So what I'd like you to do, if you've done it on paper, can you take a photo as normal and send that to me on my email? Um, if, you, if you're doing it on your computer, just share that as normal via Show My Homework. Um, as always, drop into the Teams chat on, on Thursday. I will be there if you have any questions. If you want me to clarify anything about the reopening of the school, um, I'm obviously doing lots of Q&A with the, with the um, leadership team, so I, I can answer probably some of your questions there because I've been probably asking the same sort of thing. So drop in, ask any questions you have and uh, good luck with your work this week.